Hi, welcome to another episode of Akiona Law Podcast, wherein we discuss all things that intersect in the areas of family law and divorce. I am Ululani Lani Akiona, and today we have a guest that I've known for a very long time, and I think very highly of him. His name is Nathan Kleiber, and he does family law and divorce. Welcome to the show, Nathan. Thanks, Lani. Uh, it's uh, good to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, um, how long have we known each other? It's It's been... I'm trying to think. Gosh, like it, it must have been before 2012 it's been at least nine yeah. or ten years at this point I guess probably 10 or 11 at least nice gosh that is a long time and you yeah. know I always just I credit you Nathan because we had we had a case together and um I kind of credit you for kind of shifting my thinking in terms of just being this purely litigation aggressive attorney to well maybe we can take a step back and collaborate together on a common solution that would be best for our client. And I know that term is, well, I mean, there's a difference between collaborative law, which is its whole field onto itself doing collaborative divorces, but really it was a cooperative Mm -hmm. where, you know, how can we switch this into more of a cooperative divorce? And you kind of really helped me kind of do that, do that little mental switch in my head where in appropriate circumstances, if you can work with the other side to do a cooperative divorce, Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was a long time ago, but my, my recollection yeah. is that that case ended up, I feel like we got it to a pretty, a pretty good outcome for both parties by, by uh, kind of listening to each other. So uh, we did. Yeah, we did. And it was tough because we had to make that mental switch. If both of us had mm-hmm. agreed, let's, let's stop this, this. Cause I mean, we, we could have, I mean, that case easily could have gone on to trial. Oh yeah. Really, yeah. and it took it really took this mindfulness on us to stop and just be like, okay, let's let's see how we or, or we can cooperate and get our have our clients cooperate as well to get the best parenting plan possible for for this young child. And yeah, it kind of easily gone the other way, and um, so glad it didn't. <laughs> yeah, and, and we've been friends ever since. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't why don't you tell us? And you've got like this interesting background too. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into family law and divorce and, you know, what, what particularly do you specialize or work in, in family law and divorce? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, right. Well, my background is, I guess it is kind of peculiar for an attorney. Um, my, my undergrad, uh, was in theater. So I was an actor for a lot of years here and a little bit in, in, um, actually more in Denver and mostly in Chicago. Um, though I'm, I'm from this area, Seattle area originally, um, I will now, did you say every... actor? Actor, <laughs> yes. Was um, that in theater? <laughs> yeah, yeah, mostly musical theater. I used to sing and dance wow. for a living, basically. Um, okay. Mostly singing, <laughs> not a great dancer. Um, uh, yeah, I'll spare everyone the story of how I ended up a lawyer after that because it take more time and isn't all that interesting. Um, <laughs> but um, gosh, uh, family law, how I got into family law. Um, I, I essentially went to law school on a dare um, and then, uh, on a dare. Was, more, more or less. Yeah. I, I, I took the LSAT on a dare, I should say, which is the sort of, um, for people who don't know the standardized test that allegedly tells law schools, how good you, one will be at lawyering or at least thinking mm-hmm. like a lawyer, uh, I think it's of, of questionable value really, but it is what it is. Um, so I basically did that on a dare. And while I was fulfilling the dare, I realized that it actually sounded all right. I, I actually might might actually enjoy being a lawyer. And um, yeah. I, I chose family law specifically. Um, I I'd, I'd wanted to work with families and, and children um, from the get-go. Um, I'd originally been thinking more at-risk youth, um, mm-hmm. maybe uh, uh, juvenile criminal defense. Okay. Um, uh, and, and I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, I did that because my parents had a super ugly divorce. And uh, a lot of times I think- Oh people, my gosh try to try to work out their issues, uh, their childhood issues through their adult careers. And I'm like that. Um, <clears throat> Wait, can I ask you really quickly, how yeah. old were you when your parents got divorced? Um, I was 16 when they started. I was, oh, uh, I think wow. almost 20 when they finished. Wow. So you, you were like right there in the midst of it. It's not like you like my, yeah. my mom got divorced from my dad when I was really little, like I think three or something. And I barely remember. I just remember her one time she was giving us a bath and she just started crying. Oh. And I just remember saying like, 
mommy, what's wrong? Why are you crying? And I know it had to do with the divorce and it's, yeah. But to be 16. No, I was, I was essentially a participant. I, I got to <laughs> watch the sausage being made in a, in a real up close and personal way. And uh, yeah. it, you know, it affected me. I've got a younger brother and sister. And, and uh, mm. so, you know, basically watching that process okay. from a, um, you know, a teenage perspective and watching my younger siblings, uh, especially my little brother, he was not quite 10 or just 10. I guess he was just 10 when they started. Um, and watching how that affected him, that got me interested in family law, basically. I wanted yeah. to help kids and work with kids and help families right. have um, less nasty processes whenever possible. And um, so, so when I graduated law school and got into practice, I really lucked out. Um, I had the good fortune of um, one of my advisors from law school had, uh, I guess, liked me because she asked me to come on and be um, a member of her firm. And that's I was working there when, when you met me. Um, okay. And uh, so I got to work under under um, a, a Jenny Laird, who's a, a, a commissioner now um, around here, right. um, and that was that was a really good experience. And then uh, when I left that firm, I was on my own for a little while, and then I came here where I'm at now, which is uh, Seattle Divorce Services down in, okay. in Ballard. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I mean, I don't know. My practice. Uh, I mean, I try to do family law generally. There's a, a couple of uh, kind of sub areas that I haven't. Um, been able to get my my toe in the door on yet like um, uh, adoptions is still adoption such a specialized mm -hmm. area um, yeah but uh, overall I mean I think you'll probably agree the the bread and butter of, of family law is pretty much divorces um, uh, but uh, you know we all, a lot of us I, myself included will end up working in you know child support specific stuff parenting specific stuff yeah. I, uh, I do have done a lot of work with domestic violence um, cases um, but, you know, honestly, what I really love, the thing that I, I love doing most is um, beyond that, I, I really, I do practice uh, the sort of formal collaborative law approach to more traditional family law issues like divorce and whatnot. Um, and I love doing that. Um, I, uh, where I really like spending my time when possible is uh, family formation issues um, where I can. Um, helping especially non-traditional families work on uh, creating structures, you know, documentation, uh, you know, helping them navigate legal proceedings where possible. So this, this comes in, um, when I was first practicing, it came in quite a bit with uh, same-sex couples. That's less of an okay. issue now. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but I, I end up working a lot with uh, polyamorous couples, so non-monogamous polyamorous couples, right? Uh, okay. Polyamorous families, uh, non non-monogamous uh, adults who may have children together, or just more than two people in a romantic uh, uh, and/or committed relationship, and trying to help them interact with the law um, in ways that. Um, uh, well, most often, what we're ending up doing is trying to figure out ways to approximate the similar the the same or similar legal protections to what a more traditional couple or family can get sort of automatically um, okay and helping non-traditional families secure those sorts of rights or at least structures that help protect them okay so this so poly polyamorous couples polyamory so you're basically in a relationship with more than one person Right. I, and I shouldn't have said couples earlier. It's, it's funny how reflexive the sort of standard language for, uh, uh, you know, our, our culture creeps in there. Even, you know, I've, I've been practicing uh, with an eye towards this for, for years and, and um, with those personally practicing uh, uh, polyamorous through, through my marriage and, and for, gosh, 12, 13 years of my life. Um, and I still sometimes use the word couple. Um, that's sort of the default unit we think of. Um, but right, so polyamory or non-monogamy in general is just, I mean, I guess it's kind of right there in, in the terminology, right? It's people who are not monogamous and specifically okay. um, not monogamous with the consent of all the people involved. So there's no, um, it's, not, it's not cheating, it's not infidelity right. because everybody involved is, is on board. Um, they're not. Not everybody's always happy and always getting along because that's unrealistic in any kind of relationship. Um, but the notion is that uh, the the people involved are not expecting monogamy from each other, and okay. um, it can get pretty complicated. Uh, the structures that can grow up out of that. I bet. Yeah. 
So, okay. So, so you're helping people then again, it's, it's a, it's a non-traditional family. Mm -hmm. And so you have, let's say you have, right. You have three people involved and there's, there's, a, so let's say we have a man and a woman and there's a third woman and then man. And so let's say Bob and Judy have a child together and then there's Stacy involved and you're there to help figure out what a parenting plan would be like between Bob, Judy and Stacy. Well, I mean, I could be there to do that. Okay. I'll be really honest and say, so you know, before we talk about any of this stuff too much, it's worth noting that non-monogamous relationships, polyamorous relationships have only recently edged anywhere near the mainstream where people even feel comfortable living okay. openly like that. So um, it's, it's culturally not a new phenomenon, but it is newly open enough that people are, are I think, feeling increasingly comfortable um, looking for legal standing or legal protections, right? Okay. Um, and beyond that, the law has only, I think, I think it went into effect in 2019, the, the de facto parentage statute, which I know you know what it is, oh, listeners right. probably, or watchers, viewers, um, yeah. <laughs> probably don't know, uh, don't necessarily know what that is, um, but it's a, a, a impressively, um, just a game changer uh, in terms of, uh, legislation on, on uh, parentage and how it interacts with uh, families with, with more than two adults, right? Um, right, well, you know, typically to touch upon the basis of de facto parentage, it was initially created to, to allow, uh, when, you have, when you have a step parent trying to come in and get a visitation schedule with the child through a divorce. That's where it's been used, I think, probably yes. most often at this point. Right. The, the original case, Inri, um, Inri LB, I think is what it was. And I, gosh, right. I can't remember when it happened. Um, it was a same-sex couple. And this was before same-sex couples could get married. It was two mm -hmm. women um, and one, um, they'd had a baby together, but obviously not genetically from both of them. It, it was uh, one of them had uh, some sort of, I don't remember the details of that, that aspect, some sort of assisted reproduction. Um, and, uh, you know, she got pregnant, she gave birth to the child, they parented together mm -hmm. for quite some time, and then they broke up. And the, the mother who had given birth to the child was angry enough to say, I don't want you to be a parent. You're not a parent. Right. You're just, you're just my ex-girlfriend. And the other mother wasn't having it and basically convinced the court to say, yeah, this is, she's a parent, we, we got to treat her like a parent. And so parenting plan, child support, all that, all that stuff. Um, and at first it was just a common law remedy, right? It was just a case law, like this one thing happened. And so now people can try this and now, now it's statutory. In 2019, I think January, 2019, um, it went into effect that there's a statute laying it all out, what you, what you can right. do to become a de facto parent, um, which is well, actually, sorry, go ahead. Have you done it? I haven't done any cases yet under the new statute. Have you? Well, so it's really interesting um, that you asked that. The answer is technically yes. Okay. Actually, I guess I guess the statute wasn't in effect. No, I guess I, the answer is technically no. I've done a couple of de facto parentage cases, but not under the statute. I have statute. two families right now, maybe three, one's only a, a maybe, but two and a half families right now who want to do this by agreement. Um, where they've all agreed that they're all the parents of uh, one or more children, and there's I is think, this the, the poly is this a polyamory family? Yeah, yeah, I've cool. got these two families. Um, okay. um, uh, uh, two families. I think both of them have four adults and currently one child. I think one of them, one of the families, is trying for another one, um, and they all want to be recognized as parents. And so this is what's interesting, and it's actually going back to where I was originally going with this, which yeah. is <laughs> everything, everything having to do with uh, with this you know, multiple, more than two adults in a family, everything is bleeding edge. Everything is, is so new, like that there's any legal standing for this at all. Because even though the de facto okay. parentage case law goes back, I don't know, like a decade, maybe right. a decade and a half now, um, the circumstances haven't come up that often. And it hasn't been solid enough that a lot of polyamorous families that I know of, at least, um, not a lot of them have, have tried using it for much. And really? so, yeah, I, it, it, you'd be surprised how often it doesn't come up, um, given okay. especially the Seattle area, there's, there's a rather large polyamorous community. It's, it's um, 
I wouldn't say it's like, you know, the most common or the default or anything, but it's not that weird around here. Okay. Um, um, anyway, which, which is to say everything that I say today about any of this stuff is super subject to the reality that most of it hasn't really been tested very much. We don't know how much of it's going to work. The ability to have three or more parents legally recognized, you know, for a child is only recently um, concrete enough to, I think, statute. yeah, right, to, to, to have it come up, to have it even start coming up. Like, the, basically, the relationships that have been formed under this haven't had enough time to break down that we're really doing parenting plans for most of them yet, and it's still um, in the early stages, which is not to say it never has, but... Um, I, I am the only attor attorney in, in the Seattle area that I know of that is focusing on this at all. And I still haven't done a parenting plan for more than two people. I have all sorts of ideas about how, how it can work. Um, I put a lot more thought into it than I have actual execution because it hasn't been necessary. Um, and- uh, Well, here's this, that's an interesting, you talked, you touched upon, you said it hasn't been necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, why? Well, so, so part of it is that we're still sort of, it's, this is still spinning up because I mean, the law moves slowly, right? So I mentioned earlier right. that there's this, there's these two families I've been trying to work on getting them into um, using the, the de facto parent statute to get them all um, recognized legally as parents of, of, of you know, whichever of their ch children respectively. Um, but I, pu I put the cases on pause. And the reason I put the cases on pause was so the, the statute went into effect in 2019. I started talking with these families then. The children weren't even born then, right? Children are okay. born right, right before the pandemic hit. So we're talking okay. about doing this. And all of a sudden, I'm in this position where what used to be the case, right, is because they're all in agreement. They all want everybody to be parents. And that should be very easy, right? Draft a petition and a final order right. saying, yep, they all agree. Agreed orders. Bada boom, bada bing. <laughs> yeah. Normally, um, at least in, in King County, um, where, where I do the vast majority of my practice, um, parenting plans and parentage stuff has to be presented in person. So when I first took these cases on and wanted to do this with these people, the notion was, okay, we'll, um, we'll put this all together. It'll be an agreement. We'll all walk down to the courthouse together. So not only do we have this agreed legal action, but because it's kind of a peculiar thing, this isn't something that a lot of commissioners have on their desk very often. Um, I'm anticipating maybe some questions, maybe some pushback. I'll be there in real time. They'll be looking at right. this loving family and I'll be able to talk to the commissioner, no problem. And then the pandemic hit and all of a sudden everything's being done remotely. And I think it's different for you up in, up in Snohomish, right? You guys are doing in-person appearances again. Yes, right? we are in person. Yeah, yeah. Down I here. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I have mixed feelings. I, I miss it though, because, because this is the thing, right? Now, if I want to do agreed orders, I'm, I'm emailing it to the court. And I don't have a chance to make an argument. I don't have a chance to point out why this is okay. And I'm, I'm for real worried that, I'll, that it'll get rejected just because it's kind of weird. And I won't have a chance to even make make an argument to the commissioner about why they should sign off on this agreement. So, because so you're worried because in the like, in, for example, right, the petition for de facto parentage. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to share my well, sorry for the people who aren't live, but I'm going to share my screen because I pulled it up. Because you're worried here that let's say you have two petitioners and two respondents here on on this petition, the courts can be like, what the heck? Well, yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely imagined as an adversarial process. Mm. Right. You know, right. and that's that's the that's the sort of conception, I think. And there's no reason on earth why it couldn't be an agreed and and cooperative pro, uh, process. There's no reason at all it should be rejected. But um, the, the, the truth is that the law is made of people. Right. And the courts are made of people and people have their prejudices and their hesitations. Um, <laughs> and there's enough open ended stuff in the de facto parentage statute. Um, um, the the uh, the factors that you're looking at. One of them is, um, you know, lived with and cared for the child for a significant period of time. And there's right. residence. Yeah, yeah, residence for a significant period. Um, time, it's, the caretaking, parenting responsibilities, mm -hmm. hold it out, bonded relationship, 
where I just passed parent foster supported relationship best interest. And here's one thing too, right? It talks about the birth certificate as well. Mm -hmm. But go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's just that the the especially the duration, the 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 requirement that the person seeking to be named a parent based on having been acting like a parent for a while has to have lived with the child for a significant period. There is no guidance in the law for how long that is. Hmm. And sure. so, so basically without the opportunity to actually talk to the, the commissioner or judge, I'm, I'm worried that these get bounced because we've been seeing a lot of different, um, a lot of different things that normally would have skated right through when we were presenting in person have been getting bounced because the courts really are wound. Oh, I mean, that's what we've been seeing down here, down in King County. Um, it was worse to be earlier in the pandemic. I think it's calmed down a little bit. And I've actually been thinking about contacting these, these families and saying, hey, this might be worth giving it a try. Um, right. Um, I've lost the thread of, of cause I was going to talk about this and then you asked me another question and I've lost the thread of what it was. Are you talking about the thread for de facto? Well, I was going to ask you, <laughs> let me ask you another question that may sure, come sure. back to you. Sure. <laughs> so my other question was going to be, okay, so let's, you know, I mean, it just goes back to uh, what you're originally talking about, where how do you, how do you form or how do you find relationships for these non-traditional relationships? And, you know, granted, there's this de facto parentage statute now that just recently came into effect, but let, let, let's just say, you know, the court rejects it. So what's the next remedy? Is it like kind of putting together like a parenting contract or something? I would try to send them for an adoption next, actually. Oh, okay. Because I, I know, um, I know a guy. Uh, I, I, I know a guy. I'm trying to say, <laughs> I, 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 I kind of want to plug him because he's a great adoption attorney, but I'm not, I'm not 100% sure he'd, he'd want me to. Well, what's his name? Because I just, I want to, I'm, I'm looking for good adoption. Okay. Okay. Um, Al Albert Lierhus, L-I-R-H-U-S, I believe. Oh, um, and he's, he's, he's fantastic. I've, I've gotten, um, I, I, I found him because through my, um, through my sort of regular life, my non-lawyer life, because I know a lot of polyamorous people having uh, been uh, I'm actively polyamorous myself for so long. Okay. Um, I have met a couple of families who have more than two adults who just adopted into a three, I think, I think he's only done up to three. I don't think he's done any four adult adoptions. Um, last time I talked to him, at least. Um, I, I oh, wow. Remember. I didn't. That's amazing. Wait, is he based in King County? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. His, his phone number is. <laughs> okay, so he can help with adoptions then for about th three people, you're saying? Yeah, I mean, I, okay. I know that he has, and he was willing to talk to me about that. I, I don't want to over, over like, offer him up for, for that, just in case, I don't know, for all I know, he's, he's, he's you know, not doing it anymore, but um, okay. it wasn't that long ago that I last talked to him, so I, I would think so. So that would be my next step. The, the de facto parentage thing should be really easy to do because it's just a simple petition and agreed final order should actually get it done. So it's sort of a fast track. It should. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Because then the adoption process takes a while. And it's way more involved and you're getting social right. workers into it. And right. um, it's, it's. I'm not, I'm not necessarily even saying that's a bad thing, um, only that mm -hmm. it's... Um, the, the way I've been talking to people is that I see no reason that if you try de facto parentage and it doesn't mm -hmm. work, probably it would be, um, I would assume it would be denied without prejudice, basically on some grounds of, oh, well, yeah, it hasn't been long enough is the thing I think right. would be most likely to be um, uh, uh, denied on. So, okay, without prejudice, we'll try again in a couple of years. Or um, if it's denied with prejudice, or if it's denied um, and you don't want to wait another couple of years, um, try for an adoption. Um, and uh, I don't see any reason why that would make a failed de facto attempt would make an adoption attempt not work, um, should be fine. Um, but all of these things depend on the, the you know, opinions and feelings and prejudices of a judicial officer in the end, right? They're either going right. to sign it or they're not. Wow. Um, you're definitely going to have to keep me posted when you go into court and how how that works out. I will. I will. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, and I guess then if they if they if they couldn't get it done otherwise, I mean, I guess we could do a contract, but it becomes a problem of 
you know, contracts between people about kids aren't really enforceable outside of right. like no, legitimate no. court, legitimate, or, you know, um, let's say rather formal court proceedings, right? Like people could sign whatever they wanted contracts about how to deal with their kids. And if, you know, they decide not to follow the contract anymore, it's very questionable whether it could be enforced at all. Mm, I mean, <laughs> it's just, I mean, all you could do really is just uh, use it as a, as an intent of this is what right. the parties planned the residential schedule was going to be once you do get a court formally. Right. Right. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, well, that's, that's a good, uh, good break to pause right now for part one of this episode right. with Nathan Kleiber, and we're talking about, I mean, we've touched upon so many different things, um, but right now, I mean, like, I, I really want to kind of get into, ask, ask people in the next episode, ask you specifically about collaborative law, because that's a, an area of law that you do too, and also kind of go more into what you originally talked about, about how you're trying to create, I guess, just certain definitive structures mm -hmm. for people who are in non-traditional relationships. So thank you, uh, Nathan, for being here with us today on the on, on part one of the Akiona Law podcast with family law and divorce attorney, Nathan Kleiber, and come back and join us for part two when we talk about what is collaborative law and go more into this trying to define I guess legal remedies, legal structures for people who are involved in these non-traditional relationships, such as polyamory. Um, so I'm Lonnie Akiona, and thank you again, Nathan, for joining us for part one. And what's the law? You work at Seattle Divorce Services. Seattle Divorce Services in Ballard. Um, wait, should I plug the phone number? Sure. All right, it's two zero six seven eight four three zero four nine. My boss will love that. Okay, one more time because you said it fast. 206-784-3049. Um, also, if you listen to like KEXP uh, long enough, you'll hear us on there too. Okay. And that's Nathan Kleiber and that's Kleiber spelled C-L-I-B-E-R. Thank you for joining us for part one and come back for part two. I'm Lania Akiona and stay safe and healthy. The information in this podcast is general advice only and should not in any respect be relied on as specific legal advice.